this section, I'm going to talk about HTTP fundamentals. Specifically, we'll talk about URLs, and we'll talk about request and response headers, and then we'll talk about request and response bodies or payloads. The HTTP request reply pattern is described in RFC 7231. Each HTTP request manipulates a resource on a service, and it requires these four things. The first thing is the URL. The URL identifies a particular resource on a service, and it includes query parameters to help fine tune the behavior of a particular operation that's being performed. Note that URLs are usually logged for debugging and diagnostic purposes, and so you want to avoid putting any personally identifiable information or PII in the URL if possible. Along with each HAP request, there is a method. The method indicates how to go and manipulate the resource, and I'll be talking about methods shortly. Headers, headers are key value pairs of strings, and they're typically used for network plumbing scenarios. Things like to control proxies, authentication of the request, caching of the request uh, response, the uh, body length and the content of the body, and conditional operations. And then finally, with an HAP request, you can pass in a body. Uh, this is typically the uh, state of the resource that you want to create or what you want to modify it or want it to become on the service. And then also in an HAP response, there is also a payload, and that is the resource coming back across the wire to the client. This, um, it is very common today to use JSON uh, as the format of the payloads that are passed in the request and responses. And I show some examples here. It could be a JSON document which has a name and an address and a phone and a mail. This is not proper JSON as shown, but it gives you the idea. And then you can also be passing binary data up in the request and responses. Uh, binary data could represent things like documents like a Word doc, Excel doc, PowerPoint, or photo images, audio, video images, really anything can be sent across the wire. Now let's talk about the URL, which is described in RFC 3986. The common format for the URL is a string that starts with a scheme uh, which is usually HTTP or HTTPS. More typically, it is HTTPS when talking to a service so that the information goes across the wire encrypted um, in both directions. And this ensures that other people can't see the data that's being sent up and back. Uh, then after the scheme, there's a colon, two slashes, and the host. This identifies the computer or the service on the internet that you're trying to communicate with. After the host, there's optionally the port. Um, usually, we don't include the port in the path. For HTTP, the port defaults to port 80. And for HTTPS, the port de defaults to port 4443. And usually, that's exactly what we want, so we leave it alone. Um, but sometimes, when you're testing a service on your own machine, you might stand it up on a different port, and then you could change the port of the client. So you can test the client and the server on the same computer, or maybe on a local area network to do some testing. After the port, if it's there, is the path. The path is a set of slash delimited segments, uh, which I'll be talking more about as we continue the conversation, um, mostly when we get into the rest section a little bit later on. And then following the path is an optional question mark followed by a bunch of query parameters. The query parameters are a bunch of uh, key equal value pairs, both of which are strings, the key and the value. Uh, and so I show an example on the next line. Here I'm using the HTTP scheme, so there will be no encryption as the request goes across the wire. I'm talking to a service called api.com, and in the path I'm saying I want to request the weather information from you. And I want the weather information from the year 1964 for the city that's Kaditz. Now you'll notice that the Kaditz here has some percent things in it. That's called percent encoding, and I'll talk about that a little bit further down on the slide. Now, the URL is a contract, and the format of it is a contract between your service and the client. URL should have a max length, and we recommend a maximum length of 2,083 characters. 
The reason for this is because there's a lot of infrastructure on the web, like routers, that have this kind of limit. So if you go above it, it's likely that some internet infrastructure or browsers or other uh, things might go and truncate the URL. If the URL is over a maximum length that your service allows, then you would return a 414 URI too long HTTP status code back to the customer. I'll talk more about HTTP status codes also a little bit later on in the course. According to the RFC specification for URLs, the URLs are case sensitive except for the scheme and the host. Those two portions, scheme and host, are case insensitive, but the rest of the URL should be case sensitive. And we recommend that when you're creating a service, you enforce this case sensitivity um, as much as possible. Now, there are some places where it may not make sense. For example, it's common to put in a path a GUID to identify some you know, a unique ID for a resource. And the GUID will have hexadecimal characters in it, you know, A through F. And those may be uppercase or they may be lowercase. And probably on your service, you want to treat them the same. So you can treat certain segments within the URL as being case insensitive, but overall, we recommend that you keep things case sensitive. Sometimes items can differ by case, but the case will affect computed hash values. That is, it's common to receive a request on the service and maybe you take the string and you compute some hash for it for some reason. Well, if the customer is able to change the casing, the computed hash will be different and now they might not be able to find something that they put there before. So again, enforcing case sensitivity means that the customer has to do the right thing and it will be the same result every single time. Also, it is common to put URLs in responses that come back from a service to a client and then a client can use those URLs in order to like follow a chain, if you will, and get more information if they desire. So those URLs that come back should be of the proper case. And, uh, and should match what the customer expects them to be. For the query parameters, after the question mark, according to the RFC specification, the query parameter order is insignificant. So in my example here, I have year first followed by city, but if I had reversed them, it should give me the same exact result, right? That should not matter. Uh, the legal characters in a URL are the digits zero through nine, uppercase A through Z and lowercase A through Z, and then four other symbols, hyphen, period, underscore, and tilde. These characters can be used anywhere in the URL. There's other characters that you can use in the URL, which I show in this yellow background here, but depending on where those characters are used in the URL, you may have to URL escape them. For example, if you look at the ampersand, well, the ampersand in the query parameter, it separates one query parameter from another. In my case, it's separating year from city. But if the uh, ampersand were, let's say, inside weather somewhere or as part of the path, then it doesn't have to be escaped. You can put an ampersand there. So it depends on the usage. So there is this thing called percent encoding, and that's a way to take these characters that are in yellow and then encode them uh, with this percent two digit thing. Um, uh, if your service is reserving those characters for special meaning. Now, it's important though to try to keep URLs to be readable. Um, URLs, as I said earlier, they tend to get logged, so you don't want to have PII information in them. But customers, when they something doesn't work properly, they will typically look at the URL to see what was the resource I was trying to talk to, what was the service I was trying to talk to, am I using encryption or not, do I have the correct port, are the query parameters correctly set. So customers will actually spend a lot of time when something doesn't work looking at the URL. And the more human readable that is, the better experience the customer will have at self-diagnosing a problem. So if possible, avoid using GUIDs or UUIDs in the URL. I know earlier I gave an example and people do it a lot, but it's actually preferred if we can avoid putting GUIDs inside the URL. Also, try to avoid using characters that would force the percent encoding. So the city cadets has this A with the accent on top of it. Because that's not one of the normal characters, that has to be percent encoded. And then you end up with this URL at the top here that looks like you know it's harder to read because it has these special characters in it. 
On this slide here, I show the anatomy of an HTTP request and a response. Let's look at the request side on the left first. So when you're sending an HTTP request to a service, you include a method, post is an example of a method, but I'll talk more about them later. Then there's the path and the query parameters. The scheme and the host were used to send the message to the service. So the service already knows that information, um, although the host is repeated in the host um, header that I show on the slide. So normally this just includes the, well, it, the path and the query parameters and the HTTP version. Then you have a bunch of headers. I show three headers here, but it's actually common to have many headers here. It could be 10, 20. Um, some services even have up to maybe 30 headers that are there. Well, we'll talk more about headers shortly. And then following the headers is the actual payload itself. In this example here, I'm using a JSON payload that has a JSON object in it that has a field called some value whose value is true. When a service receives this payload, it then has to parse the query parameters like color equal orange. It has to parse all the header values and it has to parse the body payload. It is incumbent on the service and critical that the service validates all of the inputs that are being passed into it. The client, any client can go and send whatever it wants to a service and it should not cause the service to crash. It should not, should not cause the service to corrupt data in any way. So it is very critical that the service validate all of the inputs that are being passed into it before it try to manipulate resources on the server side. Once the service has performed the operation, it will then send an HTTP response back to the client. The response includes the HTTP version, a status code, uh, which is just an integer number, three digit integer number like this 200 example here, and then a reason phrase uh, this is just a string description of the status code. So 200 always means okay. Following that um, response line are any response headers. Here I show three, um, but it's also quite common again to return many more headers than three in a response back to the client. And then finally in the response, some responses will have a payload in them. Here I'm showing again a JSON payload. It's the same object that was sent up so post was maybe creating this in the items collection. And then the response says, this is the item you created in that collection. It has a value called some value with a value of true. On this slide, I show common request and response headers. The headers shown in bold are very likely to be used headers. That is, we expect a lot of services to be looking for these headers and honoring them. The headers that are shown not in bold, those are kind of depends on the service as to whether or not you want to implement them. The second column applies to indicates whether that header applies to a request, a response, or in some cases both. That header is sent in the request and it is also returned in the response. And then the third column gives an example of uh, what that header value might look like. A lot of these headers I'll be talking about later in the course. So, um, so I'm not going to describe them now. You'll, uh, we'll talk about them when I talk about distributed tracing or conditional access or telemetry and so on. The, the other thing is these are all sent as strings. Headers are all sent as strings, the values. And so you have to have a clear contract as to what the format of that value is going to be. So if you look at example here of the date header, that has to follow RFC 1123 format which means it looks something like this Sunday, the 6th of November, 1994 at 849.37 GMT time. And of course, it's critical that this is a contract between the client and the service because the client has to send the date in this format so that the service can successfully parse the value in this format. And then the service should send a date back to the client. And then the client has to be able to parse that. So having a clear contract on what these things, values of the headers are, is critically important. And then that has to be maintained over versions of the service. A lot of these headers are defined by the HTTP specification. So they, this, the HTTP spec dictates what these values should be. Um, okay. <clears throat> so now let's talk about header and query parameter contract. I've already been talking about the contract quite a bit, but just to be a little more crystal on it, uh, for the header keys contract, the header keys are case insensitive. 
Unlike the URLs, which are case sensitive, except for the scheme and the host, the header keys are case insensitive. But we recommend using lowercase for the header names because HTTP2 mandates it in the future. So if you start using lowercase for the headers now, then if you migrate to HTTP2 in the future, you're already set up and ready to go. Um, for headers that are custom to your service, a lot of times people prefix those headers with an X dash to kind of say this is an extension header. But from RFC 6648, this is actually discouraged. And so we would recommend for new custom headers, you do not prefix them with the X dash. Unless, of course, that header key is already well established and you want to maintain consistency with other services that are maybe part of your company. And as I already mentioned, the query parameters and the header values, they are strings. And so you need to have an explicit contract for these. So if a, to treat a string as a Boolean, the contract should be that the string must be true or false in, low, in all lowercase letters. If you want to treat the string as an integer, then you know, it'll have a bunch of digits in it. Um, but notice that due to RFC 8259, um, let me phrase it a different way, most languages will support this integer number and load it into an IEEE 754 floating point number. And the IEEE 754 format, which is this RFC 8259, it sets a limit of integer values from minus two to the 53rd plus one to positive two to the 53rd minus one. We have a lot of services that use 64-bit integers. And then in certain languages like JavaScript, where they don't have integers, their number is an IEEE 754, large 64-bit integers or small assigned 64-bit integers cannot be represented in that language. And it ends up causing interoperability problems. So make sure that if you're using integers, try to stay within this range of minus two to the 53rd to positive two to the 53rd. If it's a floating point value that you're sending in the header or in a query parameter, then again, that follows the IEEE 754 binary 64 value and make sure it can fit within a numeric type or a variable of that numeric type in all client libraries that might be consuming your service. If something is going to be a string, then indicate in your contract whether the string needs to be quoted or not quoted. What is the maximum length that the string can be? Is the string value case sensitive or case insensitive? Um, if it can have multiple strings in it, what is the delimiter? Like are the comma delimited? Is it semicolon delimited? Is white space um, you know, significant or white space insignificant? These are all things that make up your contract uh, maybe even the valid, valid characters that it can be expressed in the string is also part of your valid contract. If the string represents a UUID, do you expect it to be in braces or not? Does casing matter or not? Usually casing does not in this case. Do you allow hyphens or not? Are they optional? Is it mandatory? Um, and then there's an RFC 4122 to look at for typically used for the format of UUIDs. For date and times that are specified in a header, like I mentioned on the previous slide, we use the time format of RFC 1123. But for date and times that are used in a query parameter, we use the format of RFC 3339. And that looks like this year, month, day, the letter T, hour, minute, seconds, and so on. Um, also, you'll notice there are three uh, digits after the decimal place, dot SSS before the Z for universal time. Um, so we try to encourage you to not go or need more resolution than three decimals after the decimal place. This gives you millisecond resolution. For durations, we also follow RFC 3339 format, which looks like you know P for period, and then the number of years, number of minutes, number of days, and then a T, number of hours, number of minutes, number of seconds. Uh, and then finally, if the string has to represent some byte array, to convert a byte array into a string, it is very common to base64 encode that. Again, make sure you set a maximum length. The string will be case sensitive in that case um, so that you can base64 decode it on the other side once it's received back.